Epilogue The pilot who landed so suddenly in the lake was a fur buyer mapping Cree trapping camps for future buying runs, drawn by Brian when he unwittingly turned on the emergency transmitter and left it going. The Cree move into the camps for fall and winter to trap, and the buyers fly from camp to camp on a regular route. When the pilot rescued Brian, he had been alone on the L-shaped lake for 54 days. During that time, he had lost 17% of his body weight. He later gained back 6%, but had virtually no body fat. His body had consumed all extra weight, and he would remain lean and wiry for several years. Many of the changes would prove to be permanent. Brian had gained immensely in his ability to observe what was happening and react to it. That would last him all his life. He had become more thoughtful as well, and from that time on, he would think slowly about something before speaking. Food, all food, even food he did not like, never lost its wonder for him. For years after his rescue, he would find himself stopping in grocery stores to just stare at the aisles of food, marveling at the quantity and the variety. There were many questions in his mind about what he had seen and known, and he worked at research when he got back identifying the game in berries. Gut cherries were turned choke cherries and made good jelly. The nut bushes where the fool bird's head were hazelnut bushes. The two kinds of rabbits were snowshoes and cottontails. The fool birds were ruffed grouse, also called fool hens by trappers for their stupidity. The small food fish were bluegills, sunfish, and perch. The turtle eggs were laid by a snapping turtle, as he had thought. The wolves were timber wolves, which are not known to attack or bother people, and the moose was a moose. There were also the dreams. He had many dreams about the lake after he was rescued. The Canadian government sent a team in to recover the body of the pilot, and they took reporters, who naturally took pictures and film of the whole campsite, the shelter, all of it. For a brief time, the press made much of Brian, he was interviewed for several networks, but the Fuhrer died down within a few months. A writer showed up who wanted to do a book on the complete adventure, as he called it, but he turned out to be a dreamer and it all came to nothing but talk. Still, Brian was given copies of the pictures and tape, and looking at them seemed to trigger the dreams. They were not nightmares, none of them were frightening, but he would awaken at times with them. Just awaken and sit up and think of the lake, the forest, the fire at night, the night birds singing, the fish jumping. Sit in the dark alone and think of them. And it was not bad and would never be bad for him. Predictions are, for the most part, ineffective. But it might be interesting to note that Brian had not been, that had Brian not been rescued when he was, had he been forced to go into hard fall, perhaps winter, it would have been very rough on him. When the lake froze, he would have lost the fish. When the snow got deep, he would have had trouble moving at all. Game becoming seemingly plentiful in the fall, it's easier to see with the leaves off the brush, but in winter, it gets scarce. And sometimes simply non-existent predators, fox, lynx, wolf, owls, weasels, fisher, marten, northern coyote, sweep through areas and wipe things out. It is amazing what a single owl can do to a local population of ruffed grouse and rabbits in just a few months. After the initial surprise and happiness from his parents at being alive, for a week it looked as if they might actually get back together, things rapidly went back to normal. His father returned to the northern oil fields, where Brian eventually visited him, and his mother stayed in the city and worked at her career in real estate and continued to see the man in the station wagon. Brian tried several times to tell his father, came really close once to doing it, but in the end, never a word about the man or what he knew. The secret. And that is the end of Hatchet.